Good afternoon and welcome to the Australian Roundtable podcast, broadcasted live from Brisbane, Australia. This is episode four of our weekly broadcast, live from 4pm each Sunday Australian Eastern Standard Time and uploaded later to watch at youtube.com forward slash Australian Roundtable. I'm your co-host Ethan from tottnews.com and I'm joined once again in the studio by my co-host Jono. Good to be here. And once again we're joined by my co-host Lindsay. Thank you and I'm really pleased to be here. Now gentlemen it's been another big week both domestically and internationally and we've got a ton to get through today but before I do that I just want to thank everyone at home for tuning in, for spreading the word and uh, for the feedback from the first uh, three episodes that we've done so far, it's much appreciated. Now, t- in today's episode, uh, in the domestic segment, we're going to talk about Iraq and a little, f- a few little updates uh, associated with that. We're going to talk about the G20, give an update on that and some of the ludicrous costs that are associated with that. We're going to talk about Senator Scott Ludlam and his aspiring hip hop career. Very interesting. Uh, then Lindsay's back once again with his Courier Mail articles and a stack of books in front of him, so we're going to talk about the uh, Murdoch Empire once again. Then we're going to get into some serious stuff. We're going to talk about Gough Whitlam and the CIA and the coup that was conducted um, in the mid-70s here in Australia. I know John has got a lot to talk about with that. Then we're going to segue into international and talk about some interesting comments that President Putin from Russia has said on Friday night during a press conference about the United States and the global uh, the global order, as you may. So very interesting. Then we're going to talk about, uh, obviously, one of the biggest stories of this week, the Canadian terrorist attacks and some of the similarities that it has to what has happened right here in Australia. We're going to talk, give an update about Ebola and uh, some, some association with that to a previous episode. We've talked about mandatory quarantining. It's now come out in New York, in New Jersey. So a lot of interesting stuff for that. And if we've got time, we're going to talk about Swiss Gold referendum and some related discussion to that, a continuation on. I know Lindsay's got some stuff to talk about for that. But before we get into any of that, uh, Jono, I know you've got a little bit to talk about, about Iraq and some updates associated with that. Yeah, well, obviously we're back at war with Iraq again, as uh, tends to be the case every few years. And uh, just during the week, it came out that uh, the Americans had apparently dropped some weapons uh, ostensibly for the Kurdish or one of the groups that are meant to be on our side at the moment, but they fell into the hands of ISIS or one of the terror groups who are against us at the moment. And this came up in a Senate's estimate hearing in Canberra on Wednesday of this week where Air Chief Marshal Binskin was asked about reports uh, that not all of those weapons had reached their intended targets. And I want to read to you just a quick summary from an article that was on ABC covering what Binskin had to say in those Senate's estimate um, hearings. I'll read this out. This is, quote, Air Chief Marshal Binskin told senators, uh, while the weapons are being dropped with precision, at least one pellet may have gone into Islamic State territory. What I understand might have happened here is probably one parachute worth of pellet has dropped into an area where ISIL might be, he said. Then when he was asked about how this could happen, his reply was, my answer is that, so what? Would you stop doing that to stop supplying the Kurds that are actually defending that town? No, you wouldn't. It's a risk you take. And there might have been a pellet or whatever that's gone to the other side. It's immaterial, to be quite honest with you. End quote. So now you think about this, Lindsay. Uh, If you are a Syrian who sends a couple of hundred dollars to family members back home, and they happen to use this to buy themselves arms to fight one side or another, you could be a terrorist and you could be charged serious doing something horrible. When our allies drop weapons to the enemy, our uh, air chief says, so what? It's yeah. immaterial. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I, what can you say about that? Um, the hypocrisy is <laughs> unbelievable. Just with that there, as Jono mentioned, we're, we're getting arrested for supporting so-called terrorists over here, which if they're rolling banks $500 million at a time don't need the money in the first place. And we've discussed this. Um, absolutely ludicrous. But, yeah, they can do this and just get away with it. Yeah. And they don't even have to give a justification for it. Yeah. So what? Yeah. So what? And the reason why I wanted to discuss this just briefly today was because I saw the film footage of this from the ABC website. And this Binskin character, who I'd never heard of prior to this incident, 
he almost seems like uh, it was an affront to ask him this question. Well, how could this yeah. happen? You know, a Senate, a Senate estimates hearing, drilling him on what's happening, and, and his reply wasn't a, well, you know, mistakes happen. It wasn't a polite court. It was almost like he was upset that he was being asked about this. Yeah. You know, how dare you ask us about how we arm our enemies, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I just wanted to bring that yeah. one up. But yeah. we've talked about ISIS and uh, the Iraq thing every week so far on this podcast, and That'll probably continue to be the case as this uh, whole mess just gets worse and worse and they slowly make their way towards their end targets, which are, of course, Syria and Iran. But I know that you, Ethan, also have some information about what's happening in Iraq from the week that's just passed. (laughs) Yeah, well, if you've turned on your television box sets or looked within some of Murdoch's papers, you may have seen that there's a new boogeyman has emerged (laughs) on our TV screens, nicknamed the Ginger Jihadist. The ginger jihadist is running rampant. Now, the story behind this is ginger haired, a strange jihadist. I love how they use that terminology. Ginger hair, a strange jihadist. What a mouthful there. Uh, his name's Abdullah El Mir. He's 17 years old and has emerged in a, quote, chilling video in which he declares ISIS will not stop their murderous campaign until the black flag is flying high in every single land. In a propaganda video for the terrorist group published on YouTube, the young white man calling himself Abu Khald, I think that's how you pronounce it, from Australia is flanked by other ISIS fighters. Elmir reportedly told his mother he was going fishing when he disappeared from his home in Bankstown, West Sydney, in June. Elmir and his friend Feeds are believed to have made their way to Syria and Iraq after crossing the border from Turkey where they were last known to have contacted family members. They travelled via Perth, which stops in Malaysia and Thailand. He begins the video by saying, This message I deliver to you, the people of America. This message I deliver to you, to the people of Britain. And this message I deliver especially to you, the people of Australia. And obviously, the media has gone absolutely rampant with this this week, Lindsay. Especially, yeah, so I know. (laughs) Yeah, no. I I was just saying, like, my mum gets the Courier Mail, and she's been going off a brain. What's wrong with this boy's parents? Why aren't they doing something with him? <laughs> so, so it's working. Whatever. whatever well, <laughs> I've got some quotes here from the video. I've just got a couple quotes here from some of the the uh, what this so called jihadist extremist has been saying. And for those who have seen the video, it's in this well produced uh, environment, and he's got. You know, 50 or so jihadists around him, and he's supposedly talking in their language as well during the parts through it. Um, (laughs) And here's some of his quotes. uh, Quote, bring every nation that you want to come fight us. It means nothing to us. Whether it's 50 nations or 50,000 nations, it means nothing to us. Bring your planes, bring everything you want to us, because it will not harm us. Why? Because we have Allah. End quote. And the second quote I've got here is, he goes on to say, To the leaders, to Obama, to Tony Abbott, I say this. These weapons that we have, these soldiers, we will not stop fighting. We will not put down our weapons until we reach your lands, until we take the head of every tyrant, and until the black flag is flying high in every single land. So they're coming for us now, Jonathan. Did he mention in his video, did he say anything like, um, by the way, we need some more weapons supplies? (laughs) (laughs) And like... It's oh, this is just this is textbook propaganda. We were speaking about this before we went on air, and I've got some friends that you know don't generally look into world politics, don't generally associate with this sort of thing, and they saw this and said, "Well, hang on a minute, this is a bit too far." I find this extremely hard to believe that a seventeen-year-old ginger-haired uh, teenager went over there, crossed through the borders, and is now a head commander in ISIS, threatening the world like this. Yeah, I mean, come on, yeah, absolutely yeah. propaganda based. It's, it's, it's shades of Hong Kong with a seventeen-year-old, isn't it? It's almost like somebody said, "Oh, we've got to get the seventeen-year-olds involved now." Yeah, yeah, it seems like that, yeah. doesn't it? Maybe they're trying to appeal to a younger demographic. These propagandists. I mean, <laughs> yeah. whether the people who are making all of this nonsense are the CIA or MI5 or um, the Mossad or whoever is responsible for all of this crap that we're being subjected to. Maybe the internal polling that we're doing was finding that the old people, like Lindsay's mum, were believing it, but younger people were going, this is, we don't, we don't believe any of this, so they thought they'd try and put a new face on it. Maybe they can get a 17-year-old to appeal to the kids. Yeah. Oh, they're going to start popping up all around the world now. 
It's funny what you say, though, uh, Ethan, when you say that uh, you've got friends who have believed most of this crap up until this point, and the 17-year-old GGG Hardest was when they said, hey, this is... Even I don't believe this. Yeah. I mean, you look at what they've tried to get people to believe since all of this mm-hmm. started. At first, they tried to tell us that these people had rolled a bank in Mosul for half a billion dollars. Yeah. And a lot of people just believe that. Yeah, they just yeah. believe that a bank would have $500 million on hand. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> then they wanted people to believe that uh, ISIS, who were back then were called ISIL or whatever, had found hundreds of American military vehicles just left yeah. there by the Iraqi military. And again, a lot of people don't see any problem with this story. Yeah. They just believed it. Even some of those people are saying, I draw the line yeah, at a 17-year-old. Ginger <laughs> Giardi. That's made the trek from <laughs> Perth. Yeah. It just, and like the information I've got here, um, it just says they travelled via Perth, which stops in Malaysia and Thailand. It doesn't even explain how they got to the border and then supposedly crossed through the border. And I saw on the project there was a, a man who was um, either imprisoned for falsely, falsely imprisoned for something in relation to sponsoring terrorism like this, and he was just going along with it, saying that they're stupid kids. It's sort of the same line that your mum's going yeah, along. Yeah, that you yeah. know what I mean. I hope the U. I hope the U.S. and the Australian government gets you and throws you yeah, in jail yeah. till you can understand. You know what I mean. And it's just just yeah. being pumped yeah, into yeah, us. Yeah. But thankfully, they've they've crossed the line where people are saying, "Hang on a minute." Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny, statistically, with the amount of different connecting flights that kid had to catch to get to Syria, he had more chance of dying in a plane crash on the way to Aleppo or wherever he is than you or I have of dying at the hands of ISIS. (laughs) I know, exactly. And and I think this has been mentioned before, but do they have a special bus that picks them up at the Turkish border and says, right, we go. (laughs) ISIS recruitment bus, there it is, get on it, boys. And then you'll become the commander. Yes. And then we can make these high quality. Who wouldn't want to go over there? Yeah. Roland Banks for five hundred million dollars. High quality studios to get a message across. Seems like the life. These, these guys. Not are... an endorsement. Not an endorsement for those listening. <laughs> these guys are putting out these fake beheading videos in high definition quality. Here in Australia, one of the biggest sports that people follow is the AFL, and the grand final isn't even broadcast in HD. Every year the fans complain, why don't we get HD football? <laughs> this is a billion-dollar industry. Yeah, can't yeah. get HD footy. But for some reason, these 17-year-olds over in uh, Iraq or Syria, wherever they are, they're putting yeah. out HD quality videos yeah, yeah. and uh, the masses are supposed to believe it. Yeah, and with these beheading videos, they're somehow immune to wind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Standing in the middle of this, the same desert every time with his little tiny knife. and Oh, it's just ridiculous. So. <laughs> But that's, <laughs> I just thought I'd update the people on that because um, it was obviously it was all over our television screens yeah, all yeah. week and I just thought we could have a bit of a laugh at that and hopefully our listeners at home also could see through the blatant propaganda that was on our television sets all week. Yes. But now um, to some more um, interesting news that has happened this week. Um, we've talked about the data retention laws. We've talked about the anti-terrorism legislation. And for the first time, I don't have an update about that which is a surprise, yeah. which is a positive thing in some ways. There was little updates, but I don't really have an update about it. But one of the senators that has been opposing this bill and the bills prior is Senator Scott Lullum from the Greens, and we've talked about he, the work mm. that he's done opposing this. He's taken a new method this week, and he's gone on uh, Juice Rap News, which is a popular YouTube channel um, where they, they do raps and they, you know, they make fun of world politics and current events and whatnot. And all of a sudden, Scott Lullum has popped up on there. And that the uh, the whole surrounding incident for this is talking about the G20. That's what the video is based on. And they've got a guy dressed up. I just thought I'd talk about this. They've got a guy dressed up as Tony Abbott talking about, hey, we're introducing all these data retention laws. And there's a there's a channel, fake Channel 9 reported there. And it's just completely hilarious. And then Scott Lullum comes in. Um, and I've got a couple of lines here from it for those... We'll put a link in the description for those who want to go check it out. It's it's very hilarious. I do recommend it. Um, Tony Abbott said, the reporter says, mind if we ask you a few questions at this time? Compliant, controlled, aligned media, right? Yeah, mate, we're on your side. In which case, that is fine. And that's what Abbott's saying when he's going to be interviewed <laughs> by um, the Channel 9 reporters. But then they're asking, is anyone opposing this? Is anyone opposing these laws? And then... 
Who, who's that? Is that Scott Ludlam? Oh, no, he's just some hippie. Just ignore him. He's just, <laughs> and then Scott Ludlam comes in and they're talking about it. And uh, apologies for some of the language. Uh, but <laughs> uh, they said, but thank God that's at all last changing. Australia is about to become the first great nation to pass laws for manda- mandatory data retention in discriminately storing our private metadata, treating us all as suspects, and thus finally ensuring, and then Scott Lutland comes in, a fascist fuckfest of Orwellian proportions. <laughs> and it's just, um, I thought this was yeah, entertaining yeah. because it's working. It got yeah. the message out. The, the video has been viewed by, you know, 20,000, 30,000 yeah, yeah. views so far and is going up because it's a popular channel. And they, the people doing this have actually supported saying, no, we need to protect our data, but they've done it in this funny way. So that was something that went viral this week that I thought, uh, was pretty funny to talk about, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I've, I've always thought that, that humour was the best way because these people really don't be, like being laughed at. So that's the easiest easiest way to put them down and to show exactly what they are. Yeah. Yeah, Ludlam has a good track record of getting videos to go viral because after the 2013 election, of course, there was the problem with the uh, Electoral Commission losing votes or something. They had to redo the WA Senate election. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ludlam was up for re-election. Our senators are up for re-election every second election, every six years or so. And uh, there was a, a risk that he might miss out on his spot. And then, of course, he did that viral video where he was um, talking sort of directly to Tony Abbott, but of mm. course it was meant for a wider audience. Yeah. Got shared you know, widely across Australia, and he won himself a lot of fans, Ludlam. And obviously I've been critical of the Greens myself uh, many times on this show and elsewhere, but I've always had time for Ludlam because he's been the one... Uh, defender of our freedoms with the internet. Mm. And so, uh, look, if he's doing popular stuff on the internet, getting out viral videos with rapping or what have you, I, I'm glad that he is because he's one of the very few people, in, I think, in the Senate who is earning a cent of what he gets paid. Yeah. yeah, and we've talked about, we talked about last week extensively how it's impossible to try and get anything through Parliament and try to make a difference within that. With these popular mediums that Scott Ludlam's utilising, it's getting the message out. And a lot of people have been flocking to his pages and been going to the website to sign petitions to stop data retention. So um, through humour, as you've said, this has just been one of the most positive news stories of this week because Ludlam has come out and has gone viral with yet another video, which is fantastic to stop these laws because they're terrifying, Lindsay. Yeah, yeah, they are. But gentlemen, enough with uh, some of the satire stuff. Oh, wait, no, we've got one more thing, don't we? You're here again with... <laughs> how did I miss it? You've got... Uh, must have messed up my notes here, but you've got your books here. Yeah, yeah. How did I miss this stack of pile here? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lindsay is back again with a Courier Mail article that's been ripped out once again to talk about some of the propaganda that's been in the Courier Mail this week. Yes. Um, I, I really can't understand what this is all about. Last week we had um, High Hitler about meth. He was a meth addict or whatever. And this week, almost exactly a week later, we have expelled Nazis on US welfare. Now, this is actually two half pages opposite each other. And there's very little um, storyline to it. It's mostly big pictures of Nazi soldiers um, looking after people in... um, Here we are. They're they're supposed to be um, Auschwitz guards um, and there's some very grubby looking people in dusty overcoats and long beards and what have you. I presume they're supposed to be Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto. I'm not sure about that. Um, Anyway, I won't go on about that, but but basically this this article... um, is complaining that, that there are too many ex-Nazis in America and elsewhere who are living off US welfare. And I saw one part of the article was talking about um, the millions of Jews that were killed, and I'm just wondering whether that's the whole thrust of the argument. Um, I, I've got a few books here that I just wanted to refer to just a couple of little passages, um, because this book... The, one, the first one I look at is How We Got to the Moon, the story of the German space pioneers. And basically this was about how the US brought these people from Germany immediately after the war um, and had them initiate the um, US space program. And it was called Operation Paperclip. You've probably all heard about it. Mm. Um, it was just interesting because 
they're saying that these they they had a six month pro, uh, program and they were on a contract and then they extended that a bit longer and eventually these people became so such an integral part of the U.S. space program that they finished up staying in America and that's why they got the welfare. Um, I I looked for a digital copy of this on the internet and I couldn't find it, but they were selling second hand copies for thirty four cents or something at Amazon. If anybody's interested in it, um, it but that that then led me to um, an interesting take um, on this idea that this is all about people bludging on the U.S. and also about six million Jews being killed. And then I looked through my library and I come up with another book called Germany Must Perish by a fellow called Theodore Kaufman. And it's basic. I won't, I won't read the passages. I've got all these passages marked in yellow, but I won't bore you with that. But basically what he was talking about, I think it was 1941 he produced this, and he was talking about sterilizing the entire German population. That was the only way to stop them. Um, Give us one of the passages. Like I'm, I'll oh, be curious to hear. Okay. I'll... I'll <laughs> Okay, here we are. Death, death to Germany. There remains then but one mode of ridding the world forever of Germanism, and that is to stem the source from which issue those war-lusted souls by preventing the kind of Germany from ever reproducing again their kind. Thus modern method, sorry, this modern method known to science as eugenic sterilization is at once practical, humane and thorough. Now, now, some of our listeners might be listening and wondering, well, who are you quoting here? What's the background yeah. to the book and the author? Okay, this 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 is um, a, a Theodore Kaufman, and I think he might belong to that tribe. Um, and the book is called Germany Must Perish. Um, Roughly when was it published? You know? 1941, I think. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it was before all this talk of um, Jewish Holocaust and all this sort of thing. Um, and then I had another passage to... Um, I'll bring up, and that was by um, Mr. Morgenthau, who was also another member of the tribe, and he was um, Secretary of the Treasury, and he had a program for wiping out Germany. <laughs> that was, and that was before it was finished. But it backfired on them a little bit because um, it was even too much for um, Winston Churchill, who you know, I mean, this is the man who bombed whole cities and whatever. But it was too much for him, and he he th- throttled it down a little bit. Um, but even having done that, um, we still have the propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, grasped onto this and, and used it to boost the German people to resist because they knew that if they lost the war, they were the, the plans were there to annihilate them. So it just it, I, I just found that these, these quotes were really quite interesting. Um, it's almost the exact opposite of what the Courier Mail has been trying to flog. Um, and for those people who, um, I, don't, I don't normally push um, Holocaust or any Holocaust or anything, but for those people who are interested, I pulled up a little piece um, off the the internet about, <coughs> excuse me, the Red Cross, and, and I'll, it's a brief quote and I'll give it to you. The Red Cross had unrestricted access to each month to every German concentration camp, including Auschwitz. They had inside men who reported to them in detail the activities at the camps. In a November the 22nd, 1944 letter to the US State Department officials, the Red Cross said, and in quote, we had not been able to discover any trace of installations for exterminating civilian prisoners. This corroborates a report which we had already received from other sources. And we can put that the, the connection to that, if you want, if people want to want to check it for themselves. Um, okay, then then the the other the other point of of all this was that the, these threats to the Germans. Um, I've I've also got a book here called Other Losses, and I find that fascinating. And we'll put a we'll put a link to that to a digital copy of that book if you like. Um, they're talking. I'll just find a a quick quote. Um, they're, they're talking a couple of million German soldiers after the cessation of hostilities who were put in camps without any sort of protection from the weather. They dug holes in the ground. They were dying from pneumonia. And they had food outside the camp, but they kept them on a starvation diet until they died. And the, the point of the other losses was that they never called them people dead in 
captivity. They just called it other losses. And it's a stunning book. Um, anyway, I won't, I won't go on any more about this, but it wasn't just the, the soldiers who disappeared. Many of the German women were raped. Huge numbers of German women were raped by the Red Army after the war. And, and not even just the Red Army. I think some, one, of, one of the ministers with the, the US troops made the point that there's very re- rarely any complaints about rape because for a bar of soap or a bit of chocolate, you get your way anyway. Um, anyway, I won't go on any more about this, but we'll try and put some links there. So for people who are interested, they'll be able to look this up themselves. Yep, yep. Well, it seems yet again the the, the Courier Mail are trying to push a perceived notion of how things were right. to be, but then when you actually look at some of the, the source documents yeah. from books and from research, you can see that it's completely not yeah. the way that they're trying to say it. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, yeah, it's, and it seems that, like they're trying to keep pushing this notion to remind people yeah. of Germany because like we joked about it last week, yeah, but yeah. that's more than a coincidence. Yeah, two yeah. weeks in a row two about Nazi month. Germany and yeah. the Korean Mail. Yeah, and and I haven't I, I haven't really been concentrating before. I don't know how long this has been going on. They may well have had other stories before this, and and it'll be interesting to see whether somebody gets into them and they have another story next week. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> It's interesting. What do you yeah. think of this, John? Well, um, for the listeners at home who might have forgotten the background to this, so the Courier Mail is the one newspaper here in Brisbane. Of course, it's owned by Uncle Rupert over in America. And so on page 18, they've got this uh, large infographic, I guess, expelled Nazis on US welfare. And obviously, as Lindsay has explained, after World War II, Operation Paperclip, which isn't a conspiracy theory, this is a fact, this is what happened, uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of German Nazi scientists and other eminent thinkers were taken back to the United States. And I think Russia also got their hands on some yeah, as well. Yeah, they got yeah. some too. And they took them back to their countries. And of course, they paid them to use their, what we would call now intellectual property. property. They gave them labs and other things to carry on with their science. And they essentially integrated into American society. And I think this is a very important part of World War II history. Yeah. It amazes me how few people know about it. There are one or two things that everybody seems to know about World War II and all of these other things that people know almost nothing about. And when you look at this thing on page 18 of the Korean Mail, expelled Nazis on US welfare, well, let's not talk about the welfare they were on. Let's talk about how they were paid by the the American government to conduct their studies. And we're talking about rocket engineers and about mind control psychologists and a whole range of people who were used in the Nazi program. They were paid by the American government to come back to America and carry on with what they were doing. So if we want to talk about the uh, the Americans wasting money on expelled Nazis, great. Let's talk about Operation Paperclip. Why isn't that mentioned in this? And for the listeners at home who don't have access to what I'm looking at right here, because as we know, Lindsay rips these <laughs> things out of the newspaper and brings them in. It's a, it's like a, in black. It's white writing on black. Arbe Machtfrey, which I guess is one of the concentration camps or something. Yeah, Arbeit. Arbeit. I think it's work. work I'm, not, I'm not good with my German. I tried to learn it once and it was just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get over how with their gender nouns, beer is feminine and, yeah. and wine is masculine. That's when I said, I'm done with German. I'm not learning anymore. But the point is, there's, almost, there's very little text here. There's just large photos that seem very scary. This is across two pages. And I guess we talked about this briefly last week. You have to ask yourself, why, 70 years later, when there's yes. un, untold atrocities taking place as we speak, many because of the governments that we pay taxes to, why 70 years later are we still getting these big scary photos splashed across our only newspaper in this country about the Germans? Now, Lindsay, you did give us a, a quick um, bit of text from this book, Germany Must Perish, which I've never seen before. I'm glad you brought this in. I'll see if I can okay. borrow this off you and have a read. But while you were quickly giving us a rundown of what you were talking about there, I had a quick look through it. And it purports to have been published back in 1941. And there are sections here essentially calling for the destruction of Germans. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> now, yeah. if you were to call for the destruction of any group of people today, any group, uh, you would rightly be, I would hope, how down by the masses. This is a book that was uh, apparently, I have to do some more research myself, but yeah. apparently distributed back in World War II, calling for Germany to be destroyed. And I guess... You're the resident World War II historian. <laughs> I'm glad that you bring this stuff to us yeah, because yeah. a lot of this stuff, even I'm not familiar with, we, yeah. we were taught a little bit about World War II in, in high school, but it was one or two narrow topics. Yeah. We weren't taught about how uh, the, a German nation, I've met many German people today and they're lovely people, in my experience, how there were people calling for their destruction back in World War II. I guess the question I ask myself and I ask you guys and our listeners at home is why aren't we taught about this kind of stuff? Well, I, I was the same. I was um, an, an after-the-war baby. And we were fed the same 
same stuff that you're talking about. It's only just, I suppose, from private research that I've got onto this, and and I'm interested. I, I'm not a, I'm not from German background. It's it's not like I'm pushing a barrel. Yeah, something like that. Mm. But I just find it like when I read this other license, that just appalled me. That you could keep people in a camp without any protection from the weather at all, and it must have been horrible in Germany. They can be dying of pneumonia, and you and you've got food outside the camp, stacked up, but you will not give it to them. You want to put them on starvation diet until they die. Now, I find that absolutely appalling. And these these were Americans, French, British, doing this. I find it absolutely appalling stuff. And we, we we kid ourselves. Oh, we're much better than them. You know, they they killed all these Jews or whatever, and and it just it just rankled with me. So that's why I sort of done a bit of a study on it. Over I'm the glad years. you did. And hopefully, yeah. um, you know, as we expand this program and and get more focused on set topics, yeah. we can spend maybe an entire show one day just discussing World War Two history and maybe some of the aspects of yeah. it that we're not taught about. Yeah. You know, the atrocities that people on our side were committing to people like the German POWs. Yeah, yeah. But we do have to move on uh, with the show. Lindsay, thanks again for that, bringing that stuff that's in. That's Welcome. fascinating stuff. I'll borrow some of those books off here as well. We need to move on. Just quickly, Ethan, I know you've got an update for us on the G20 and some of the costs that us uh, Brisbane Knights and Queenslanders are incurring for the privilege of having these uh, 19 countries plus the EU's head of states come and pay us a visit. Yeah, well, I only saw it this morning. It was published by the Sydney Morning Herald uh, down in Sydney, and I found this really int- I found it really interesting because obviously I've been researching the G20. The G20 is only a few weeks away, right here in Brisbane, so we're going to be talking about that. And as we lead up to the G20, um, but it, it was an article talking about the costs that are associated with the G20, and obviously there was the standard cost talking about security and police and the the accommodation that they're going to be having and the cars that they're going to be driving and how much it's going to cost us all up for this. But I saw one little thing that was quite amusing to me, and it was the it was the debate surrounding the table that they use. So apparently they use the same table at every G20, and it's going to cost us $150,000 to move the table to Brisbane. Once it's there, it's going to cost $36,000 on top of that to extend the table further. There's been a big decision. They want to extend the table a little bit more. And then to top it all off, they're going to spend $68,000 on chairs for the people to sit at. And I looked at this and said, I was just absolutely gobsmacked by this. Almost $250,000 being spent on a table and chairs for these people, you know, that are coming here in a matter of weeks. Uh, uh, absolutely ridiculous, John. What, what is so special? Did the article explain what is so special about this uh, particular table? <laughs> no, it didn't. That's that's where I'm lost for words. I didn't even know until I read the article that they were... They had to move the table over here. I just thought there'd be a default table yeah, there yeah, for yeah, yeah. Like, What is... Six to eight thousand dollars on chairs, like they yeah. better be the best chairs that anyone's ever sat on. That it's costing us that much for this yeah. to happen. I just, yeah. I, I remember ages ago I read an article about toilet seats in planes for the army or something, and they were a phenomenal amount of money, you know. And mm. so I think it's just, I think that's what it is. <laughs> somebody, somebody will be getting a fee kickback well, somewhere. Yeah, well, there's <laughs> evidence all around the world of just expenditure that's yeah, just yeah. not needed. Yeah. Air conditioning in Iraq and everything like this. It's just ongoing lists. Um, but this this was something, because I didn't even yeah. know about this, and it was buried right in amongst the costs. And I said, I scrolled past and I said, wait a minute. And I went back up. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah, Absolutely unbelievable. There may, there may be something special about that table. Um, I've, I've got to be careful getting onto this, but but y- you know how they go on with owls and things. They've got their own little eyes in the pyramid and all that sort of mm. stuff. There may be something special about this table that's been dedicated or something like that. We don't know. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. There must be something special about yeah. the table, whether yeah. it's a table that's immune to being tapped or something <laughs> like this, or whether the wood was specially carved yeah, yeah, yeah. through yeah. history, blessed by someone, or some something yeah, yeah, happened. Yeah. That's there's got to be an excuse for yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't see why they can't just have a default table that's each year. It's just, but anyway, that was that was uh, one thing. But uh, where I do they think... store this table in between G twenty summits? That's what I want to know. <laughs> what what is it doing in the meantime? I I 
I'd we, pay 20 bucks just to lay on the table. It's a, <laughs> it's a quarter million dollar table. Yeah. <laughs> with, I mean, with any luck, if we pull our cash, maybe they'll let us do a podcast from it after the, sh- after the G20's finished. <laughs> Coming to you live from the quarter million dollar table. Yeah, yes. the special round table podcast this week coming <laughs> to you from 150000 This table costs you taxpayers $150,000. But that was just one thing I wanted to mention, but we, we are short for time. There's just been a huge week, and I know we want to get stuck into some serious stuff right now, and Jono's got a lot of information to talk about. As we've known, that Gough Whitlam has just passed away, former Prime Minister of Australia, and Lindsay... Uh, Sorry, Jono's got some information speaking about this. Yeah, so obviously with the show, we try and do a domestic segment and an international segment. And this is the last uh, topic we'll do for the domestic one, but it is an important one. Uh, Gough Whitlam, a former Prime Minister of Australia, passed away on Tuesday. He was aged 98. And um, the main reason I wanted to discuss him was because the story of how he was dismissed back in 1975 should be enough to open people's minds to the idea that just because you're an ally of the US and just because we mostly have white skin here in Australia, it doesn't mean that they're not going to interfere with our politics the way they interfere in so many other countries. And so what I'll do is, we haven't got too much time, I need to move on to the, to the international stuff, but I'll give a, a quick background on what happened with Gough Whitlam in 1975 and then we'll have a, a quick chat. But uh, basically, Gough was the Prime Minister from 1972 to 1975. He won the 1972 election and the 1974 double dissolution, uh, double dissolution election against uh, Billy McMahon and Billy Sneddon, respectively. And he was dismissed by our Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, in the 1975 constitutional crisis. Now, for those listeners who aren't aware how the Australian system works, it's based on the Westminster system, so it's not so dissimilar to places like Canada and New Zealand and Britain. The Governor-General is essentially above uh, the politics and very rarely does anything. In fact, the only time that we've had it Prime Minister dismissed was in 1975 and we don't have time to go into the the background of the 75 constitutional crisis except to say that uh, Gough Whitlam thought that he would be okay if he went to the Governor-General and asked for a new election. Instead, the Governor-General uh, Kerr gave the Prime Ministership to his opponent, um, Fraser, and next thing you know, Fraser's the Prime Minister, they call a new election for 1975 and Fraser wins the 75 election, and that's the end of Gough Whitlam's political career. Here's the interesting part. Uh, Remember that in 1973, the CIA had overthrown the Chilean leader, Salvador Allende, and installed Augusto Pinochet. So they were in form when it came to overthrowing countries of the governments they didn't like. In November 1975, just before the 1975 uh, election, Gough Whitlam himself declared that the then country party leader, Doug Anthony, had close ties to the CIA. So don't take my word for it that uh, the CIA was involved. Goff himself said back in 1975 Mm. that the then country party, which is now called, of course, the National Party, leader Doug Anthony had close ties to the CIA. And in 1966, Kerr himself had joined the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was an international anti-communist group. Now, the CIA's own website has said of the cultural uh, the congress for cultural freedom and i'll quote the congress for cultural freedom is widely considered one of the cia's more daring and effective cold war cold war rather covert operations end quote so that's the cia's own description of this group that 1966 kerr himself had joined now john pilger has a terrific article about all of this from earlier this year and i'll link to it in the info box underneath our video today but here's a short passage quote In interviews in the 1980s with the American investigative journalist Joseph Trento, executive officers of the CIA disclosed that the Whitlam problem had been discussed with urgency by the CIA's director, William Colby, and head of MI6, Sir Morris Oldfield, and that arrangements were made. A deputy director of the CIA told Trento, Kerr did what he was told to do, end quote. Now, if you read that article by John Pilger, you'll see a whole heap more damning evidence that the CIA was involved in that ousting of Gough Whitlam. But the best evidence, and I'll link to that again uh, in the info box, the best evidence comes from a guy called Christopher Boyce. Now, there was a US spy named Christopher Boyce who in the 1970s was convicted and jailed for selling secret information to the Soviets. And he was eventually released 25 years later. So he was jailed for a long time because he had sold some very important secret information. 
Now, he worked in the CIA Black Vault Communications Relay Room in California, where much of the information came from Pine Gap. Mm. Now, Pine Gap, I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with it, but here's the basics of it. It's a satellite tracking station just outside of Alice Springs in the heart of Australia. And its operations began around 1970, when hundreds of American personnel were stationed there. And it's now home to, depending on who you listen to, up to a thousand CIA and NSA personnel. Now, in 1982, a 60 Minutes reporter by the name of Ray Martin, who I'm sure many of our older listeners will be more than familiar with, conducted an interview with uh, Boyce from his prison in Kansas. And I'll just read a short passage from that interview. Uh, Ray Martin. Only the Russians know exactly what secrets Christopher Boyce gave them, but the CIA calls what he did the most damaging act of espionage in decades. Boyce says that what finally turned him into a spy was America's deception of Australia. Christopher Boyce. My government was deceiving an ally, perhaps had been an ally for two world wars, an English-speaking parliamentary democracy. I thought it was indicative of to what my country had sunk to. Ray Martin. Boyce and his espionage accomplice, Andrew Dalton Lee, sold the Russians the codes and other secret details of both the Rhylite and Argus projects. According to Boyce, that is much more than the American's partner, Australia, ever got. Christopher Boyce. When the Rhylite project was first put in place, the executive agreement meant that all information was to be shared between the American government and the Australian government. And along came Mr. Whitlam. When I went to work for the project, the initial security briefing that I had, I was told that, in fact... We weren't going to live up to that agreement and that we hadn't been and that there was information that was being withheld and also that the Argus project, which was the Advanced Rylat project, was to be hidden from the Australians. End quote. Now, the Rylat and Argus projects uh, were censored on advanced satellites to monitor the Soviet and Chinese rocket launches. And again, I'll link to that entire transcript from the 60 Minutes interview in the info box, but I'll just give you a few more quick quotes from Christopher Boyce. Quote, Mr. Whitlam was not a popular figure at all within TRW, to say the least. Mr. Whitlam was, by wanting to know what was going on there at Pine Gap, and by publicising it, was compromising the integrity of the project. Mr. Whitlam's government was a threat. There was a bit of celebration that Mr. Whitlam had been canned. There was references to your Governor-General by the Central Intelligence residents there at TRW in the Rylite project. They called Mr. Kerr, our man Kerr. Well, my conclusion is that either central intelligence directly or through intermediaries would have had to have infiltrated the hierarchy of your trade unions at some level. End quote. That is just a few things that Boyce had to say back in 1982. And again, this is a man who was imprisoned for selling secrets. This isn't some crackpot conspiracy theorist. This isn't someone like me who reads books and studies history and wants to tell you what I think. This is a guy who would know very well he spent 25 years in the slammer for selling the secrets to the Soviets. And he says, in his own words, Whitlam was taken out by the CIA. He wasn't liked because he investigated things like Pine Gap. And of course, Pine Gap still exists here in Australia. To this day, our parliamentarians are given no access to it. This is all legitimate stuff. And so Mm. with the passing of uh, Gough Whitlam, I thought it was uh, the right time to mention some of these things because for someone like me, when I first started learning about the constitutional crisis and the CIA ties. That was one of the first things that opened my mind to just the extent the tentacles of the CIA. And that's why I wanted to discuss uh, that issue with you guys today. Now, Lindsay, you were a young man back during the 75 yes, yes. constitutional crisis. Do you have anything to add to what I've said? Yes. Um, I <laughs> And I haven't got, going demented, I haven't got <laughs> the names at my fingertips, but there was a, a quite a, a, a scandal on um, about CIA people. Um, and I'll try and do some research during the week. I might be able to update you on that. Um, one of the vivid memories of CIA was George Bush Sr. coming down off a plane, and I think it might have been Sydney Airport, and laying down the law to us and what we would do and what we wouldn't do. And I was taken back by this. I thought, man, I mean, I know he's you know, something, but just to treat us with absolute contempt and tell us mm. what we... And it just became clear to me then, oh, we're a vassal state. That's that's anyway. That that was just one of the memories that I've always carried of, of, of that man. Yeah, there was no no dip- diplomatic effort at all. He was just laying down the law to us. This was George H. W. Bush, yeah, yeah. who <laughs> who before he became president of the United yeah. States was the head 
of the CIA. Yes. I mean, this is why I say to people, look, conspiracy theories are interesting and I love them. But you know what? History is even more fascinating yeah, yeah. because so few mm. people know anything about it. The head of the CIA later became the president of the United okay. States. His son became president of the United States, and it gets better. Guess who's running for the Republican nomination <laughs> yeah. for the 2016 <laughs> presidential election? Yes. It's his other son. Um, yes, yes. Are you what? You want to? You want me to believe this is all coincidence? <laughs> mm. Get yeah, out of here. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Ethan, I know that you as well like to study intelligence, especially in this country. Everything that I've just gone through uh, here, this all corroborates with the stuff that you know as well, I'm sure. Mm. Yeah, well, it's it's referred to by many people that study this as the forgotten coup that happened here in Australia. And through this week, there's actually been a couple of good um, international sites uh, that have done actually articles on this to, uh, in reference to Gough Whitlam mm-hmm. dying, saying, hey, remember that the CIA had influence through yeah. it. And this is, this, is what this, this is the extent of control that's through it. And don't get me wrong, I'm not the biggest fan of Gough Whitlam in the world, but he did do some things that, were, that did challenge the system. And one of them was, you know, trying to discover more about Pine Gap, which obviously now today um, it's been revealed that uh, we were helping uh, drop drones. We were directing drones from Pine Gap here in Australia that were being dropped in Yemen and and Pakistan Mm -hmm. and Libya. We were directing them here um, from Pine Gap, and there's obviously a lot more has come out from Pine Gap about the extent of metadata collection and the the influence that it's had uh, throughout Australia. But Gough Whitlam was the first Prime Minister to come out and say, hey, look, um, I want to know what's going on there. I want to regain some control of the country yeah. that I'm supposedly supposed to be leading. Yeah. And since then, it's come out that the CIA influences completely throughout everything. We've talked about Udolf Ukot talking yeah. about the journalism industry, about CIA assets in there. Uh, Bob Carr was revealed as, yeah. as leaking Labour uh, party secrets back to the CIA yeah. uh, since around the time that Gough yeah. Whitlam was dismissed. And I think it's interesting because these people, I mean, the majority of the public have no idea about yeah, this and they're not going to be told by the mainstream media no, no. because, you know, it, that's just what happened. And if for someone to not question, hey, the Governor General just dismissed a Prime Minister and all of these quotes have come out and people saying yeah. that he was a threat to the establishment by enforcing all of these things, you know, trying to enforce legislation to have a more transparent, open society, a society with universal health care, recognising Indigenous rights, all of these things that he was doing were going against years of tradition. Mm. And he was a threat, much like the same mirror image that JFK was when he was trying to come out to say, hey, there's um, we oppose secret societies um, in our country. Yeah. And by the time I'm out of office, I'll expose this plot. It's... It's just it's just interesting to see that um, with historical facts that the CIA and secret societies um, are riddled all throughout our facets That's of life, and this was one of the uh, primary examples of that, yeah, which just, people just came to the surface. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. I, and I think it's there. It's like an, a huge ocean, and every now and again it comes to the surface, and you see one or two instances of mm. how it's affecting us. Yeah, and with the mainstream media, I mean, one of the things that you have to understand as you do more of your own research is that you understand that the mainstream media doesn't really have to hide things. You know, that 1982 interview was a 60 Minutes interview. That mm. was a, a mainstream interview at the time. Earlier this year, and I'll repeat a quote in a moment, the Australian Renan article talking about how Boyce still maintains his view to this day. They can report on these things, but if it's just one report every few years... It's very quickly forgotten by the masses. That's why when they're on a propaganda campaign to take away our civil liberties, and we're going to discuss Canada in the international segment soon, that's why it's constant bombardment. Because the average person has an attention span of a goldfish. So if the mainstream media does cover this once or twice a decade, who cares? When they want you to know something, that's when they bombard you with it 24-7. And earlier this year, The Australian, which of course is our national broadsheet owned by Uncle Rupert, they did print an article talking about how Boyce still maintains his views because he's out of prison now. He did 25 years, now he's out, and they interviewed him once again. And there's a quote that I want to finish this little topic on. And this is a quote from Boyce from that The Australian article. Quote, to me, that was a coup. You Australians can call it whatever you want. End quote. And hey, like I always say to people, what do I know? What do you know? This guy knows what he's talking about. And if he says that's a coup, 
the very least that someone ought to do is to look into it for themselves, Lindsay. Yeah, definitely. I agree. But that's enough from me, boys. We've only got, uh, we're 50 minutes through into a 90-minute show, so we need to move on to the international stuff. Now, I know that we're starting off, Ethan. You want to get into the discussion of Putin, his comments on America. Yes. Well, I don't know if our listeners have seen it or whether you gentlemen no. have checked out the full video, but on Friday, uh, the Russian president delivered a fierce, broad broadside aimed at the United States in a speech from the Valdai Club in Sochi, um, which was an informal group of scholars gathering together, and the conference was called, ironically, World Order, New Rules or a Game Without Rules. And this was a conference that was opened up to the public, and there was people of English and translated and everything asking questions uh, to uh, the, the panellists that were there. And President Putin was one of the panellists, and obviously he was bombarded with questions regarding Ukraine and regarding the entire just world structure at the moment. And in a surprising um, move, because we haven't seen Putin really come out as full on as this, he's remained a, you know, a democratic approach, he's mm. tried to you know, remain democratically and not put much personal opinion into it, but he'd come out Friday, and I was watching this live, and he hit out at Washington for behaving without regard to the rest of the world's interests. So he's pushing the notion that um, the U.S. have shaped the world prior post-World War II. They've shaped the world to fit their own interests. And I've got a few quotes here from it, and we can get into this discussion once I go through some of the things that he said and how this relates to a bigger picture. Um, but the first quote that I found was interesting when he got straight into it was, quote, the U.S. has been destabilizing the world order of checks and balances for its own gain, end quote. He added then that the U.S., the so-called perceived winners of the Cold War, he pushed the notion that they weren't the, the winners of the Cold War, are trying to create the world for, quote, their own gains, end quote, which has weakened global and regional security. Any country that does not agree with Washington's view of affairs is all but blacklisted, and we've seen this all throughout history, pretty evident. Um, his second quote that I found interesting was, it doesn't matter who will replace the USSR on the... A on America's axis of evil, Iran, China, or Russia? And he asked the question. He said, one of us is going to take the new um, axis of evil. We're going to be the new boogeyman that the U.S. is going to post up as the next global threat. It could be any one of us. And he asked the question back to the journalists, which one of us is going to be on America's axis of evil? Um, Putin clearly lays the blame for an ongoing terrorism in the Middle East squarely with the United States, and that was interesting, for policies that have been repeating themselves for decades. He also accuses the West of, quote, turning a blind eye, end quote, to the entrenchment of international terrorism into Russia and Asia. And this is where he starts to talk about um, terrorism in the Middle East. He quoted, US foreign policy peddled as democratic values. Go ahead, prove me wrong. Total control of media allowed the US to sell something black for white. We see the U.S. backing murky activists from Nazis to fundamental extremists. It never ceases to amaze me how our partners have been guilty of making the same mistakes time and again. They have, in the past, sponsored Islamic extremists who were battling against the Soviet Union, which took place in Afghanistan, and it was because of this the Taliban and Al-Qaeda were created. And then towards the end of the speech, he summed up by saying that he alluded to fears that Russia are looking to expand their empire and that Moscow is looking to destabilize the world order. He quoted finally by saying, quote, our U.S. counterparts are soaring at the branch they sit on. So I thought that that was one of the biggest things that have happened this week mm -hmm. because in the global scheme of things, um, this is really interesting stuff, Lindsay. Yeah, yeah. Um, my, my take on Putin, I've always been a little bit worried about him because I thought he's just another KGB operative, or, you know, a fairly high operative. Um, but when I saw him, when the Syria poison gas business was on, and America wanted to go in and gung-ho and take over, and, and he was the only one anywhere who had a sensible, balanced attitude to it, mm. and it worked out, you know, and, I, and ever since then I thought, no, no, there's, there's more to this man than just a thug, so, mm. so I, you know, I, 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 I'll go away and have a read of that myself. And, well, yeah, well, it yeah. was... Yeah. Really surprising, he, yeah. he lashed out for the first. Like he's always kept a democratic approach yeah, through yeah. the MH17 incident, which was blamed yeah. on him when they have nothing to gain from doing that. Um, through the, the chemical yeah. attack and their support for Syria, the supposed chemical attack that happened, 
remain democratic to say, look, we'll sort this out on an international level. And finally, when he's come to his personal opinion, he said, no, look, the US counterparts are soaring at the branch they sit on. And Jono, we've talked about um, the conflict in the Middle East and how this could build up to draw Russia in because of their allies and how this could lead to a much bigger situation. What is your take on the Well, I'm sympathetic to uh, Lindsay's comments. Obviously, with Gaddafi in Libya, uh, the UN put through those no-fly zones, which ultimately led to Gaddafi being enrolled, and that's just been a disaster of a nation ever since. It seems as though Putin learned his lesson and wouldn't let the same thing happen to Syria. So on the UN Security Council, he vetoed the motion that would have essentially led to taking out Assad, the same method. And ever since then, it seems as though the West has been trying to uh, bother Putin. And, you know, we talk about the coups that the US can do overtly against people like uh, Allende in Chile in 73 or more covertly in uh, Australia in 1975. They were doing it before the 70s. They've been doing it ever since. Iran. Um, Exactly. And what, well, Iran's a perfect example. And so what happened in Ukraine earlier this year was clearly clearly another CIA-backed coup. And sadly, we've had so much to talk about on this show in the three and a bit weeks that we've been doing it. We haven't actually had a chance to do a feature bit on the Ukraine crisis that was, like I said, clearly and blatantly another CIA coup. So I'm sympathetic to the point of view that Putin actually is, uh, if not a good guy, certainly not on the same side as the bad guys. Of course, there is this other perspective of, hey, Putin knew as well as you and I do that it wasn't Russians who shot down that plane. I mean, he knew yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, his defense uh, ministry or one of his defense chiefs released a bunch of information at the time that wasn't very well publicized. They've got their own media um, in Russia today. They could easily disseminate all of the info that they have. They've got, they might not have the same sophisticated spy net, satellite network that the US has, but you would infer that they would have more evidence than they released to prove that it wasn't them and that it might have actually been the Ukrainians who were responsible, yeah. the Ukrainian junta who was responsible for what happened. So the obvious question is, why then doesn't Putin release this information? And then you'd go further. I mean, there are things that we know that the American government has been complicit in, things like 9-11, which, you know, something, depending on which study you listen to, 30 or 40% of Americans think the official story is nonsense, right? You would think that Putin would have information on that. Yeah. Again, from what I can tell, he's not forthcoming in that. You have to ask the question if he's really... I mean, people aren't saying he's the good guy, but if he's genuinely a force to to protect and not to expand and he's you know, a good guy relative to the bad guys who are in charge of us, why hasn't he released more information? I mean, not, I'm not saying that I'm against Putin at all. And uh, when he comes to G20, he'll be one of the few leaders who I don't despise. <laughs> but, but there is this... I see this on places like Zero Hedge and other alternative outlets... There's this perception that, oh, Putin is the last good guy standing up to the West. And I hope that's true. I Mm. I would love it if that were true. My personal view is I'm not convinced, but I am open-minded to being convinced. Because, hey, we need a hero right now. (laughs) And it's not going to be hope and change Obama. It's definitely not going to be this pinhead Abbott. Who who is going to be the person who says, hey, I'm not interested in expansionary war. I just want to lead my country and try and make the place better. And there's no doubt that Putin has been terrific domestically for his people there. Is he genuinely standing up to what we might call the new world order? I'm not so sure. What do you think, Ethan? I think you raise a good point there, that we do need to look at the bigger picture. And um, I do obviously have some hope, but once you actually look at it and some of the points that Jono raised about, um, you know, some of the th- some of the things he could have released... Um, it's it, it makes you question and it's good to encourage people to just question and question and question because who knows, you know, Putin could be part of the scheme as well and he's been, you know, developed as an alternative for us. Yeah. But at the same time, this is all controlled too. But I'm hoping not. I'm hoping not. But once you understand history, you can see that it, um, it's obvious to keep an open mind about that because anyone that does speak out against um, the, the established order, as we've just discussed, we've got with them. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I tend to agree with both of you. I'm, like, like you're saying, I, I look at Putin and I think he's a nationalist. He's looking after his own people, and I admire that. Yep, yeah, yeah absolutely. But, um, that, that, I wish our blokes would do the same. Yep. But, it, yeah. but the other one, I, I remember, you may, may or not remember, there was a plane crash, a Polish plane crash. Yes. And I think it might have even been in Russia. And, and it took out, it might have been the Prime Minister or somebody, but yeah, and, and that, I've still got that sort of thing in the back of my mind thinking, you know, I've, this bloke's, it, it could be two sides to him, and I really don't know. 
Yeah, for the listeners at home, I haven't got the information in front of me, but just from memory, Lindsay, that that Polish plane that went down took out a huge swathe of their executive government, yeah. maybe some other important people as well. And if you know where to look on the internet, there is footage that's floating out there that purports to be from immediately after the crash. Yeah. And you can even... Because the plane crashed shortly after takeoff, if memory yeah. serves me yeah. correctly. And you can actually hear gunshots and you have to wonder what... Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, if, if this video was legitimate, um, what's with the what's with the gunshots? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much geopolitical stuff and domestic stuff to look into. I haven't had enough time to really get my teeth yeah. into that Polish plane crash, but I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because... Yeah. Yeah. It's very much relevant to this conversation, well, isn't well, it? I, that's how I felt with Putin. It, all up, I think it's none of us are going to know for another few years to see what the, the end result is, Absolutely. and then we'll know whether he was the good guy or whether he was yep. uh, you know, playing just being being a good chess player. That's yeah, well, it's it's good to encourage people to yeah. keep an open mind and can yeah. continuously question in a world full of deception. But in speaking of questioning. Uh, what the mainstream media and what the political establishment have been telling you. I take that as a good segue to move on to our next topic we're going to talk about, probably the biggest issue that's happened this week, uh, that's happened in Canada, the supposed terrorist attacks that have been done there. And I know uh, John has got a ton of information to talk about with this and the relation it has to Australia. Yeah, for me, this was the biggest news uh, this week that I wanted to discuss, and I want to spend a good portion of today's show discussing these uh, so-called terror attacks in Canada for a few reasons. Uh, First, the incredible similarities between the timeline of events which are taking place over there right now compared to what we witnessed here in Australia uh, just a couple of months ago. The second reason uh, is that Canada is a member of the Five Eyes, Uh, along with ourselves, the United States, uh, Great Britain and New Zealand. And the creeping totalitarianism in any of our ostensible allies is of direct relevance to us here in Australia. And the third reason is that I was inspired to get into alternative news podcasting by some of the people in North America using YouTube and other outlets to get the truth out there. And I'm specifically talking about people like Jeff C of Free Radio Revolution and 49 of Up North of the 49th who I'll link to in our description box uh, under the YouTube video mm-hmm. uh, on YouTube. And I tune into their shows every week. They do roundtables not too dissimilar to what we're doing now. And I think it's important for us to show solidarity with our uh, non-zombie brothers and sisters around the world uh, as we all make this slow descent towards uh, starcism. And I say it's a slow descent, but really it's quicking up very yeah, quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before I go any further, I want to give a quick background on what we call the Hegelian dialectic or problem-reaction-solution. Now... This is a method used by the powers that be for the purpose of what one might term conflict management, except that they're not managing organic conflicts, they're managing the conflicts that they instigate themselves to arrive at a predetermined change. Mm. So for the purpose of increasing state power, it's a method to make the masses not only accept the removal of their liberties, but to demand it. That's the way they operate. And just I want you to just keep this in mind as we go through the background that I want to give to what's happened in Canada over the past week or so. Now, of course, Canada is a country of about 35 million people, so it's a bit bigger than Australia, but we share many similarities. Definitely. And, of course, as I said, they're a member of the Five Eyes Alliance. Now, the first part of what I want to go through today is a basic recap of what's happened in Canada over the past week or so. On Friday, October 17, the terror threat level was raised from low to medium for the first time since 2010. Now, I will point out that this is an internal system. It's not a public terror system like we have in Australia. But yeah, on Friday, October 17, their terror threat level was raised. On Monday, October 20, a 25-year-old named Martin Rulo uh, conducted a supposed... This is the official story, by the way. I'm not saying that I believe any of this, but this is the official story. Conducted a hit and run on two Canadian Armed Forces personnel in a car park. Uh, That night in Parliament, the Conservative government suggested it was a terror attack, well before the police or even the media had made any such claim. Uh, One of the soldiers died of injuries the following day and the other is expected to recover. The next day it was revealed that uh, this person, Martin Rouleau, was on the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, watch list and had had his passport revoked. He was a recent convert to Islam. After he supposedly mowed down these uh, personnel, the police happened to see it somehow. or They saw him, they they chased him down in a high-speed car chase, he flipped his car got out of the car armed with a knife, and they shot him seven times. That's the official story. So that guy's dead now. But our Australian listeners will be sitting here going, hold on, there's a lot of similarities there to what happened in Australia. Taking away his passport, 
supposedly decides to take out a couple of police or military personnel for no apparent reason, dies before anyone can find out his motive. A lot of similarities, but I'll move on. So that was on the Monday. On the Tuesday, Canada's six fighter jets, which they pledged to the Iraq War 3.0, departed for Kuwait. Wednesday, October 22, a 32-year-old named Michael Bibo, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, shot a reservist who was standing as a ceremonial guard at a war memorial, and the soldier died shortly afterwards. Bibo made his way via two cars, including one that he commandeered, to the nearby parliament buildings, where he was apparently there to shoot some politicians. I guess that's the story. The sergeant at arms of the Canadian House of Commons, which is like a ceremonial prestigious role, I'm not too familiar with the Canadian political system, somehow obtained a 9mm pistol and shot Bibo dead. Uh, and in the days since, the Canadian mainstream media has been awash with coverage of these terror attacks. And if you check out their social media and online fora like Reddit, half of the stories and, and all the comments are about all of this. This is They're being bombarded with it the same way that we were bombarded about mm. Newman Hayter, whereas I've already intimated there's a lot of similarities between mm. these stories. Now, I want to move on to the obvious agenda here. I'm going to read out a large passage from an article from the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, from Friday, October 24th. So Monday is the hit and run. Wednesday is the parliamentary attempted shooting. This is Friday, October 24th. I'm going to read out a large passage, so please bear with me, listeners, but this is very important. This is why I think this is the biggest story of this week. Quote, Public Safety Minister Stephen Blamey is giving more indications of how the government intends to strengthen Canada's security laws in the wake of Wednesday's attack in Ottawa on Parliament Hill. The minister told Radio Canada on Friday that the government is eyeing the thresholds established in Canadian law for the preventative arrests of people thought to be contemplating attacks that may be linked to terrorism. Officials are considering how to make it easy to press charges against so-called lone wolf attackers, end quote. Now, obviously, that's my emphasis, but I've, I've emphasized the important parts there. Uh, preventative arrests of people thought to be contemplating uh, attacks that may be linked to terrorism, lone wolf attackers. Now, if someone listens to me talk about our government, uh, our opposition, Bill Shorten, or our leader, Tony Abbott, for more than two minutes, you could accuse me of being thinking of contemplating uh, terrorist lone wolf attacks on our... I mean, you could easily accuse me of that. I would never do that. I'm not a violent person. But look how loose this language is. Mm. Preventative arrests before you've done anything wrong, when you might be contemplating things that may be linked to terrorism. I mean, this language is so loose that only someone with not a single ounce of critical thought in their head could read it without being very concerned. But the article gets worse, and I'm going to read out more of it to you. Quote, The challenges are thresholds. The thresholds that will allow either preventative arrest or charges that lead to sentences or more simple operations, Blaney said in French. So what the Prime Minister has asked is for us to review in an accelerated manner the different mechanisms that are offered to police to ensure everyone's security. In a subsequent interview with, MB, uh, with CBC News, rather, he said the measures recently introduced in anti-terrorism legislation don't go far enough. When we tabled the Combating Terrorism Act, we activated some capability for our law enforcement to do some preventative arrests, he told the program Power and Politics interview to Air Friday. What we are realising now is there are some thresholds that would need adjustment so that it is more practical and more functional to intervene. End quote. Now, I've got a whole heap of stuff to read out here. We're not going to have time to go through it all. But just based on what you've heard there, Lindsay, what do you think? Well, I think we talked about this last week. Um, it's it's when they're putting the screws on. They, they've got nothing. There's no um, suspicion of anything for anyone. They're just, they'll mm. just come after you and close you down. Yeah, and exactly what you're saying. And, and I said to you last week, you want to be careful what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, <I wait>. <laughs> Well, we spoke about the Global Patriot Act, and this is where it all ties back to. Um, obviously, we've seen the similarities between Australia and everything, in part under this UN Resolution 2178 says that all countries are going to have to enforce a bill such as the Foreign Fighters Bill that's going to be passed here to arrest people on their thoughts and beliefs without committing a crime, um, to to put them on curfews in their houses, to implement fingerprinting and iris scanning at airports and everything. This is what's coming under this broad terminology of terrorism. And over in Canada, it seems like they're even they're making it even more broader to say that we can just detain anyone that questions yeah. the system. But you need to 
people need to see that this is becoming a global thing yeah, and it yeah. seems to be following the same script every single time. The same yeah. things are happening, the same bombardments. I watched uh, Dan Dix from Press for Truth and some other Canadian uh, me, uh, Canadian alternative media over there try, that were on the scene in Ottawa trying to question and that the, the police were harassing, that it was a difficult situation to try and get any information about this. And it it's eerily uh, suspicious and has a lot of um, re- relation to what happened in Australia. And for those who don't know, there was a bill that passed last week as well called Bill C-13, which had sit in Parliament um, since it was adjourned in the summer. summer. Um, bill C-13 makes it illegal to circulate an intimate image without the subject's consent. That's what the, the broad justification mm. of this legislation is. But it also includes a host of new lawful access powers, such as new warrants for police to access online data, phone records, and for digital tracking. Critics have warned the bill's thresholds for warrants are too low and that cyberbullying law is too broad and vague. The bill also grants immunity to telecoms that voluntarily hand over data, a sticking point raising privacy concerns. The Supreme Court's Spencer decision in June ruled that warrants are generally required when seeking subscriber information from telecoms. So, amongst all of this, a bill has been passed to increase the monitor and digital tracking of people the same way it has happened over here in Australia. Mm-hmm. And it, you'd be crazy to not question this, Jono. Yeah, absolutely. And when I mentioned the problem reaction solution, here's where you see how obvious it is. Let me read out to you a couple of quotes following the Monday incident. Because even though the Wednesday one's getting all the coverage now, this is all part of a broader campaign. That becomes clear when you look at the reaction following what happened on Monday. Here's a quote from the RCMP Superintendent Martine Fontaine. We will, uh, this is a quote. We work with the tools that we have and we work with the police that were close to him and people that could influence him, said Fontaine. It's difficult to do more because we could not arrest someone for having radical thoughts. It's not a crime in Canada. Unless we have clear indications of what he was doing, it was very difficult to prevent, end quote. So you see what he's saying there. We can't arrest him. Like, we knew he was radical, but we can't arrest him because that's just thoughts, Mm. all right? Let me read out to you another quote. This is from Foreign Affairs Minister John Baird. Quote, "I'm, I'm trying to think through what you could possibly could have done to stop someone who has not been arrested or not been accused of any specific criminal offense, Baird told Evan Solomon, host of CBC News Network's Power and Politics. End quote. So here we have the foreign affairs minister saying, well, he hadn't committed a crime. Yeah, yeah. What could we have done? Well, obviously, well, you're well, going to have to do something. Yeah. And that's the whole point, yeah, isn't it, Lindsay? Yeah. This is problem, reaction, solution. They're saying, hey, look at the problem. Yeah. We, we even know about these people existing. We know there are people out there with these scary thoughts. But what can we possibly do? Yeah. These people have rights. And here's where the reaction yeah. comes in. The masses, the dumb, unquestioning masses, as opposed to say, well, I thought of a solution. Why don't you just lock them up for having radical right. thoughts? Yeah. You see? And that's where the solution, the, solution. The, yeah. the government then says, well, that's, gee, you guys are right. Why didn't yeah, we think yeah. of that? Yeah. Let's take away people's rights to stop people from getting killed. This is classic problem, reaction, solution. And look, it was obvious to people like us, and I'm sure many of our listeners, yeah. what happened here in Australia. But if it wasn't obvious enough, look at how they used the exact same script in another country. It's the exact same thing. Mm. Create the problem, let the masses have the reaction, and then hit them with a solution. And here's another similarity. In Australia, we... And look, I I don't have time today because we are running out of time, but I've gone through, right back through this year, looking at the CBC's coverage of ISIS. And month after month, you can see there's been key points where they've criticised the government for not doing enough. And the government will say, we're trying to do more, but what can we do? We're constrained. So you slowly build up this idea of a threat in the people's minds, Mm. and then you have a crystallizing moment. Now, in Australia, we had the raising of the terror alert, and then the following day, or a couple of days later, there were those mass terror raids. Then you had the chatter amongst the populace, part of the masses saying, we have to do more to stop them, part of the masses saying, no, 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 this this is just a, there's no big problem. Then a couple of days later, you hit them with the big papa, the big problem, which in the Canada, that was the Wednesday attack, uh, alleged attack mm-hmm. on this um, reservist who was for some reason guarding a memorial. In Australia, that was the Newman Hater incident. So you see what you do? You build up the fear, build up the fear, then you hit them with the old one too. The first event, which is pretty scary, get the masses uh, fighting over each other. Then, once you've got that set up, hit them with the old right hook, 
the big event, and then all of the resistance is quashed by the masses mm. demanding that you take away their civil mm. liberties. Now, that happened to us and Ethan in the first couple of episodes of this podcast, which our listeners can go back and listen to. I recommend they do. You gave a fantastic coverage of those laws. There was three bills, I think, all up, or three parts of legislation that every single one of them was bad enough. The fact they all were tried to pass together, uh, very concerning. We saw that happen in Australia. Now it's done. That's it. They could come and apprehend us. They could walk up to this house right now and take all three of us away without charge for two weeks. They, they can legally do that now. No questions asked. Well, in Canada, now we await. What happens next week? What laws do they rush through in Canada next week? I'm willing to bet any amount of money that I have to my name that they'll be very similar to what happened in Australia. Oh, yeah. Taking away people's civil liberties and giving the intelligence agencies more powers, more funding to protect the masses from the boogeyman that they've all been told is out to get them. Definitely. Yeah. And it seems like Canada watched what happened in Australia. We've talked about Australia being somewhat of a test dummy for all of this to be brought in. And it worked a charm. And now all of a sudden it's popped up in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. You may recall um, at the, the Iraq War 2003, both Harper, I believe, was in at the time. Or is Harper in now? Stephen Harper is the Prime Minister right now. Yeah, Harper was now. Well, the Prime Minister at the time, during the Iraq War, um, when they were campaigning to go there, John Howard and that Prime Minister, I can't remember his name, I'm sorry to the listeners at home, not quite familiar with Canadian politics, they read the exact same speech. Yeah. yeah the yeah. exact same speech yeah, yeah. telling that we have to go, yeah. to we have to protect our... Yeah. And now, once again, the exact same thing is happening yeah. in both countries and... Us over here, we're trying to speak out against it. In Canada, there's alternative media coming to speak out against it. And once this all goes through, it's going to take away our freedom to do this and they're going to start getting rid of anyone that questions the system, trying to block them out completely. And this is a scary thing because it's it's starting to come on a global level now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's scary. No, no. Well, it's it's not just about this. I, 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 I take in what you're saying. But years ago, I was looking at the painters and dockers. They had a, an inquiry into the painters and dockers. That's a union, by the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. For our international listeners, that's a union here in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the painters and dockers. Yeah. yeah. Um, waterside workers, whatever you, morphies, whatever you like to call it. Yeah. And the end result of that inquiry into criminal activity on the wharfs was that they had all those bank changes. Yeah, you, you had to have a certain number of points of identification. There was a whole list of things, mm. and it just so happened they did the same in all the other. Western countries. Yeah. So, so it wasn't something. Obviously, they wanted an inquiry to implement what they'd been told from above, and and it's happening all the time. It's in completely different areas. It's happening. Yeah. It's the smart way to do yeah. business if you are the government, and yeah. of course, the government is simply carrying out uh, an agenda much bigger than yeah. the politics that we see on TV. You don't just uh, enforce it; you make the masses yeah. ask for it. Yeah. And how do you do that? You scare the hell out of them. Now, someone like you and me, we'll laugh about the Ginger G. Hardy. We'll laugh about the fake ISIS beheadings. And we'll laugh about how ISIS supposedly found Harper. I mean, it's laughable to us. But to many people out there, they think the news is real. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, you, They have a little kid, and when the kid gets old enough to ask questions, they say, oh, the movies are just fake. They're just actors. What most people don't tell their kids is, that's the same with the news. I mean, I'm laughing about it, but I'm not exaggerating yeah. Yeah. one iota. Your news readers are just actors. Yeah. That might be their real name in real life. That you know, Joe Blow on the Channel Seven News. He, that might be his real name in real life. But when he sits there in front of the camera, he's an actor. The problem is that the masses, most of them, think that this yeah. is real. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea is to scare you or to make you angry, to use your emotions against you, to demand that the people above you take your rights That's away right. from you. That's exactly what's happening in Canada. I'll give you an example. If this all sounds a bit abstract, on October fifteen, the Canadian government announced that it would soon table a new CSIS, that's their intelligence agency, a new CIS, CSIS bill which would stop cross-examination of CSIS sources. Let me read you a quote. Public Safety Minister Stephen Blaney, there's that name again, has unveiled new federal plans to boost protection for intelligence sources by giving them the same protections bestowed upon police informants in criminal cases. Currently, police can use information from secret informants to obtain search warrants or wiretap authorizations without fear the sources will be subject to cross-examinations. However, if those same informants are used as evidence of an accused person's guilt, the protection does not apply. End quote. Now, just think through what this legislation means. If they, if the same thing was passed in Australia, and for all I know it was in that myriad of legislation that was passed a couple of weeks ago, 
They come and take you and I away, Lindsay, for whatever purpose they have. They put us on trial. Evidence can be used against us from an informant that we can't cross-examine, that our defense counsel can't cross-examine. I mean, are people listening to this? That's terrifying. Now, this was on October 15, and of course, what's happened? what happened the very next week, this entire propaganda campaign that I've just been discussing. And that sees the spill will be passed. There's no doubt about it. We have to, Look, we've only got a few minutes left, but I want to get this last point out. In Canada, they have fake opposition just like we do. Okay, this is how democracy works. You get your problem reaction solution, you get the masses demanding something for that group because not all the masses are going to go along with this. There's going to be dissenters like us, mm -hmm. but maybe dissenters who don't realize there's a bigger agenda. They just dissent on the grounds of, hey, this is a bad law you're passing. So they are attracted to the so-called opposition. So in Canada, they have their opposition parties just like we have ours, and their opposition people are saying things like, you know, we support tougher laws, but we're not going to go too far, too far. but it's all nonsense. For one thing, in the Canadian Parliament, just like here, they've got the numbers. And at least here in Australia, our Senate can vote things down. If our two major parties both support it, there's no voting it down. Yeah. And of course, our mm. opposition did support all of our laws, yeah. so yeah. it went through. In Canada, their major opposition party is saying, well, we, we're not going to support all the changes that you want. But here's the problem. Over there, their Senate is just like the House of Lords in Britain, who are not really a yeah. House of Review. Yeah. They're essentially a nominal appointment. They reject something like two bills per year. So whoever's the lower house in Canada, uh, for all uh, intents and purposes, not quite a dictatorship, but as, as close as you're going to get in a so-called democratic framework. It'd be like here in Queensland where we have a unicameral parliament. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Canadians. If you want to move to another country a bit more like your own, the weather's a bit different, but we have the same as you. A uni, essentially a unicameral parliament. So here's the thing. The conservatives uh, who are in power in Canada, they've got 55 out of 105 Senate seats anyhow. So in any which way you look at this, this is going to happen. So if you're someone who's new to this discussion of the, the bigger agenda and the powers that be, the increase of state power towards totalitarianism, just like what happened in Stasi, Germany in the 1930s, which Lindsay, you being the World War II historian, know <laughs> all about. If, if you're listening to this and you're saying, hold on, it couldn't be this simple. It's not going to happen like this. Well, follow, please, follow Canadian politics for the next week or two because that's exactly what we're going to see. These laws are going to be passed, just like they were in Australia. The opposition is going to be token. It's going to be nominal. It's going to be it's going to be nonsense. These decisions were made a long time ago, and right now, all we're looking at is the theatre, the yeah, theatre yeah. for the dumb, unquestioning masses. Mm. Yeah. I think they call it a dog and pony show. I think that's what. It's <laughs> <laughs> that's all it is. So, yeah. guys, look, I, I I've got twice as much as what I just re uh, spoke about to report on today, and this is such an important thing. But obviously, our shows are kept to ninety minutes, and I don't want to go through any more of the information I've presented. But before we do sign off on this topic, boys, final thoughts on what's happening in Canada and what we can expect over the next week or two? I think you hit the nail right on the head. It's going to follow the exact same path that Australia has taken with new legislation. This legislation, without a doubt, yeah. is going to pass. Um, it's just, as I said, it's a move towards getting rid yeah. of free speech on a global level. And it's coming because the, this definition of terrorism is so broad. And we've got people like the Ginger Jihadi, boogeyman on TV. We're giving up our rights because of that? Yeah. Absolutely unbelievable. And I think people need to start questioning this because yeah. now it's starting to come on a global level. Yeah. Now our brothers and sisters in Canada, guess what? The same thing's happening to them. And soon there's any voice around the entire world is going to be shut out. And that's a concerning thing because it's coming. This is not a, you know what I mean? This is not a, a, a little concern that I have. When, yeah, yeah. when you follow history and when you follow the exact methods that are being taken place with the problem, reaction, solution. Um, Especially yeah. when you're tied in with David Cameron's speech that you went a couple Definitely. of weeks ago, which we covered, which again, I'm sure most of our listeners are familiar with, but uh, just quickly, David Cameron said that anyone who believes that 9-11 was an inside job or anyone who believes that 7-7 bombings, official story is false, is a non-violent extremist. And they're the kind of people who we want to censor. Those are his words, not yeah, mine, yeah. by the way. So you tie David Cameron, the British Prime Minister's speech, in with what's taking place in Canada and Australia when it comes to freedom of speech and civil liberties. Where this is headed is blindingly obvious. And this is why I don't spend any time you know, outside of this podcast trying to wake people up. If somebody is sleepwalking over a cliff, they're not really asleep. They know what's coming. They, um, they want to keep their eyes closed. Mm -hmm. If you can't see what's coming now, 
you're never going to see it because there's part of you that doesn't really want to admit what's going on. And if that's the way you are, that's the way you are. But for people like us who can see what's coming, the least we can do is try and create an environment in a community where people can discuss this. Yeah. If you're looking at the news and going, that's crap. What I just saw is crap. Trust me, you're not alone. There are people out there like us. We happen to be the minority because we don't control the airwaves. The airwaves are controlled by people who want this to happen. And it's going to happen. And I'll finish on this topic with a quote from Harper. This is a direct quote from Harper, by the way. And again, with everything I've discussed, the links will be in the info box under the video. This is a quote from Harper. The laws need to be much strengthened. And I assure you, Mr. Speaker, that work, which is already underway, will be expedited. End quote. Now, we did want to discuss Ebola quickly. I think we might have just enough time, Ethan, if you want yeah, to give I'll a just, quick update I'll just give Ebola. a quick background because this is also very important. I think we'll, we'll, we'll get into this discussion next week, but in the final uh, five minutes or so that we do have, um, following confirmation of Dr. Craig Spencer, who was the doctor in New York, some of the, uh, our listeners and would be familiar because it was all over the news this week, um, contracting Ebola in New York when he returned, um, from this, the states of New York and New Jersey have announced a screening system that supersedes guidelines established even by the federal government. Now, in a press conference held on Friday, the same time Putin was having a press conference blasting the United States, um, Governor Christie with Governor Cuomo, who are the respective, um, respective governors of each uh, region, um, announced that there's going to be mandatory quarantine for travellers from affected Western country, Western African countries uh, returning. So they'll be subject to the new laws and those determined to have exposure to the disease will be quarantined for 21 days at a government supervised facility. Specific procedures for quarantine and hospitalization will be determined by New York and New Jersey health departments. And a quote, voluntary quarantine, this is talking about people handing themselves in, etc. You know, it's almost an oxymoron. This is a very serious situation, Kumo said in a, news pro in a news conference. Voluntary quarantine. Raise your right hand and promise you're going to stay home for 21 days. We've seen what happens when that's enforced. Now, finally, Christie said that New Jersey has, quote, very aggressive authority to enforce mandatory quarantine. We spoke about this in episode two about the, how the CDC is talking about rounding up well persons, how the state of Connecticut is talking also about rounding up well persons. And now it's come out in New York and New Jersey that mandatory quarantine will be in play. Uh, Jono, what do you think of this and the bigger picture that might be at hand here? Yeah, look, obviously I've spent a lot of time talking about what happened in Canada because I think that's so important. But I do feel bad that we haven't given this topic enough time because this is incredible. We did discuss Ebola in one of our early episodes and how they're going to use what you might call medical martial law to completely invalidate your civil liberties. I mean, when I speak with young people, they almost don't seem to see themselves as sovereign subjects. They seem to see themselves as just part of the state and whatever the state wants goes. But once upon a time, people did believe, no, if the government wants to detain me, they ought to be charging me because I've done something wrong. What the government is going to do in the United States, we speculated about this and now it's happening, mm. is to say, well, you can forget about your rights. We're going to detain you for the benefit of society. And the really scary thing is that when you ask people hypothetically, do you support them being allowed to detain anyone against their will if they might have been exposed to Ebola? What's scary is how many people I've spoken to in real life discuss, uh, say that they do support this. Your friends and family might not come to your aid if people turn up to your door in hazmat suits. And so what's just happened in New York and New Jersey is the two governors have said, that's what we're doing as of now. And they've already done it. I mean, officially, at least, they've already done it to one person. One person, they've said, we are going to detain you. It, when you take a step back and think about it, yeah, we saw this coming. We even discussed this on the show. Mm -hmm. like, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But when I saw, I, I watched this live, I watched those two governors address uh, their nation live a couple of days ago. I was home, so I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll tune in. And sitting there listening to it, uh, it was hard not to, I guess, really reflect at the time on what I was listening to here. They are stating point blank, you do not have any rights anymore. If we want to put you somewhere for three weeks, we're going to put you there. And um, mm. this deserves more than the five minutes we can give it, but yeah. uh, very serious stuff. It's like a pincer movement. We, you were talking that before about, when you were talking about, uh, my head's gone blank. Um, Canada. Yeah, Canada, yeah. We take away your right, your freedoms, your rights, because people want want it. And this is the same thing. Oh, we're going to take away your rights. So it's almost like a pincer where they're pinning you between Ebola and 
terrorism and they will do whatever that's they a, want to do. Yeah, fantastic point. Yeah, it seems it just seems like that's yeah. the way it's going. Exactly, and that's why when they announced because this was a live announcement between the two governors of New Jersey yeah. and, and New York, they did a joint press conference saying this is what we're doing. You know, unilater- unilaterally is. Let me pronounce that properly. Unilaterally, as states, we're not uh, happy with what's yeah. happening federally. Well, just a day or two before, those same two governors and a bunch of federal health experts had fronted the media and said that Dr. James Spencer has self-quarantined. Prior to doing so, he was on the subway yeah, and he went subway. bowling and all these things. But don't worry, there's there's no problem. Everything's going to be fine. And a couple of the media people asked questions like, well, you know, why would he do this? Da, 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 da. And anyone listening to this was, going to, was thinking to themselves, how could a doctor do this? Like, what? Mm. why would a doctor, mm. if he knew that he'd been in a place that had this um, problem, why wouldn't he immediately self-quarantine? You know, I was asking myself that, and, and I'm sure many people listening would have been asking that. And if you followed the American media at the time, this was like, yeah, like it, it was almost like the media was now getting stuck into the federal authorities. You know, how, how could this happen? How could you let this happen? That was the whole idea. Look, people, mm. we can't even trust a doctor. And I'm yeah. sure, I don't have the quote in front of me, Ethan, but when I watched these guys live the next day, you know, so they've got the problem. Look, we had a doctor, didn't solve quarantine. Then you get the reaction. <laughs> then they front the media again a day or two later. Here's our solution, auto-quarantining. One of them even said, look, we couldn't even trust yeah, a doctor. Could, uh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah they quoted that. Uh, I wish I had the quote in front of me. I apologize for not having that. But uh, again, we'll have the link up in the description box. That was what they said. Mm-hmm. Look, we couldn't even trust a doctor. So how can you trust yourself? How can you trust your neighbors? Problem, reaction, solution. Once you understand how the Hegelian dialectic works, you can see that it's being used right now. And as you said, Lindsay, pincer movement. The people are slowly, not even slowly, (laughs) the people are are quickly and surely being moved into a state of fear and panic and distrust. And when that happens, what's the solution? Hey, big government. Mm -hmm. Just like that. We'll have to spend more time on that one next week, Ethan, but obviously we're running out of time today. We don't want to go over 90 minutes too often, but this has been a big show. It's been a huge week. Mm, and we'll, we'll, we will get to some... We'll, we will discuss Ebola more next yeah. week and we will get into a lot of more topics because it's just so much happening yeah. at the moment yeah. in yeah. the world. Yeah. Um, so we do we, we do want to hopefully talk about Tony Abbott's uh, daughter and yeah. the, the information that was released and the lady that released it and caught. We, we, will, we will get to your goals. Oh, yeah, that's right. We will get to your goal discussion, Lindsay. We yeah. didn't have time, unfortunately, today. Um, and we'll obviously keep everyone updated with the stuff that we've talked about. Can I make a, an apology for last week? Um, I said I was going to go away and research the, the Greens um, being bought off or something like that. And when I did do it, it wasn't them at all. It was the Democrats... And it was over the GST backflip they did. Okay. So so I do apologise for them for running them down. But anyway, I think I covered myself and I think I said I had to go away and research it. So that's what I've done. And that's how you know that we're the alternative media. Because when we get something wrong, here we are fronting <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, I guess we have just a couple of minutes to go through just some final thoughts uh, from each of us. Uh, apart from that very uh, respectable apology, uh, Lindsay, any other final thoughts before we wrap up? Um, the, the only thing... Um, I, I keep coming back to this. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote those books, The Gulag Archipelago. And and I just, every time I see something happening in Australia, I refer back to that and I think what what they had in Russia is happening to us now. It's it, it's so clear if when, once you've read the books. Um, that's, if anybody, I mean, you can you can even get his books now in digital copies. They're, they're available. So that's, I'd recommend them to everybody. If you yeah. can, if your stomach will bear it because it's some pretty gruesome stuff in there. I've put a lot of literature already for me to get through. <laughs> if I get through what you've already given me, I'll move on to those books. But my final thought is I finally got a chance to listen to Mick Raven, who is based down in Sydney. And he's, from what I can tell, I hope I'm wrong, but from what I can tell, he's essentially the only person, apart from us, doing a weekly podcast on discussing the news from an alternative slant. I've managed to go through the last month or two of his back catalogue. Heaps of good stuff he has a website, conspiracyoz.com, I think. He does a Wednesday and a Sunday podcast, about 90 minutes of material for the week, doing some really fantastic stuff. And uh, for all of our listeners, if if 90 minutes of us talking a week isn't enough, <laughs> check out Mick Raven down at conspiracyoz, uh, I think it's dot .com. Dot Conspiracy com. Oz, just check it out, Mick Raven. Do some really good work, and um, I've been enjoying listening to his stuff. Mm. And my th- final thoughts is pretty brief. Just stay vigilant, everyone. Continuously question everything that you see. 
um, within the mainstream media and within society and continue to please join in and <laughs> <laughs> view the Australian Roundtable podcast to get the latest in international and uh, domestic alternative and independent discussion. Enjoy us while we're here because very soon we'll be gone. <laughs> <laughs> He's not joking. <laughs> anyway, right. guys, I think that's it for this week. Um, remember to subscribe at Australian youtube.com forward slash Australian Roundtable and we will see you next week live from 4pm. Thanks everyone. Yep, bye bye.